Lord, as we gather together today, we ask for your blessing. We ask that you fill this house of worship with your presence, that we may feel your life flowing into us, and we might find peace and healing from the truths of your word. Help us to connect with you and one another today, and uh, help us be uplifted as we go out this morning. Amen. songbooks and sing on page 150, Sanctuary. I invite you to stand.
sing one more song. This is on page 120. My life is in you, Lord. 120. up my eyes unto the mountains, from whence comes my help. My help is from the Lord, who made the heavens and the earth. Amen. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Lord, as we bow our heads before you this morning, we recognize our need for your life to be conscious in us, for us to be conscious of you at all times. With you, all things are possible, and without you, we can do nothing. So we come to you today, ask for healing and for hope. Open your word that we may understand how we may live, and strengthen us and encourage us and show us your ways. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. O Lord, forgive us our trespasses. Amen. I you all to be seated, and children, I invite you to come forward if you'd like to do that for your talk. Good morning. How are you? Good, good. Welcome, everybody. So you remember what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, what the idea is that we've been talking about? Anyone? Hmm? 
Healing, very good. You remember that we're talking about healing. And today's another story about the Lord healing somebody who had a sickness and what they were dealing with, there was a woman who had an issue of blood or she was bleeding for like 12 years. Can you imagine that? Imagine what that would do to you. You feel very weak, very, very helpless. And she tried all kinds of things to get help. And finally she encountered the Lord and saw him and he was able to heal her. And it's interesting how she got healed. So let's hear that story and then we'll talk a bit more about it, okay? It's from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake, where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay for them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Amen. What a beautiful story about this woman who had been suffering for so long and she was just able to touch the Lord's garments. Imagine the Lord was wearing something I don't know if something could have looked like this, I suppose, but wearing this, and the woman just came behind him and just touched it like that, and she was healed. Why do you think that happened? Yeah. Because the Lord has magic. The Lord has magic. The Lord has great power, right? Something like magic, I suppose. Like great power, and even just his clothing that he was wearing was enough to heal her. Now, one of the things that I think is interesting about this story is that the woman had tried so many things to get well. Now, I imagine if you were sick like that or I was sick like that, we would try everything, right? The one thing she hadn't tried yet was being in touch with the Lord. So she thought, I'm going to try that. She just touched him and she was made well. And this garment pictures the truths from the Lord's word that help us to be healed, help us to know the Lord. But I want to think about this in terms of bread this morning, thinking about why is it that we learn the Lord's truth from his word? Why do you think we learn that? Do you have any ideas? Is the Lord's word truth powerful? Yes. Yes, we talked about that a couple of times, right? The Lord's truth is very powerful. So we learn it and it helps us. And we think about that in terms of like how we bake something, like the rules of baking. How many of you have ever baked some bread before? Yeah? Uh, kind of. Kind of? <laughs> Did it work out well for you? Got kind of huge. Otherwise, yeah. Yeah. You made bread. Cool. So here's some things that we need to make bread. We have some flour, right, and some salt, some oil, some water, and some yeast, and a little bit of sugar. Now, if you follow the rules of baking bread, you know that you need to add yeast if you want it to get high, right? To get it puffed up. And the yeast needs to eat something in order to get all bubbly and rise. You know what that is? It's sugar. The yeast eats up the sugar and gets all these bubbles that create it, and that makes it rise up and get fat or thick. So I made some bread the other day, and I didn't use any yeast. <laughs> what do you think about that bread? Does that look good? Mm. Feel how heavy that is. It's pretty. I didn't really follow the instructions very well, did I? Not that heavy. Yeah, it's pretty hard, though. <coughs> Does that look good? Yeah, look. I, can, I, I can rip it open. I bet you can, yeah. Well, can it's pretty I tough. Can it open? It's pretty tough bread. Here, you can try. So maybe it's not the best loaf of bread in the world. Good job. All right. Um, so I didn't follow the instructions, and it didn't work out very well. So I tried it again 
And I followed the instructions, and it turned out a little bit better, right? I'm really not happy. I wish it was a lot higher, but I think my, my liquid was too hot, and it didn't help the yeast. So I could learn how to do better, right? And that, you don't need to rip that apart. We'll just keep that together, OK? That thing's hard to rip. But then there's people who really know how to bake bread, and they made this beautiful loaf. Look at that big loaf. Doesn't that look nice? Nice and squishy. No, you don't like the look of that. <laughs> All right, well. Yeah, it does look kind of tastes, good. It tastes good, but. The inside is okay. It's really good. They can eat. I don't know what they eat. You guys can eat, eat some of that during our snack time, okay? Oh, by the way, here's that. Oh, thank you very much. All right. And here's this. So let me just tell you one thing about this is that following the instructions in baking bread is kind of like learning what's true and doing the truth. When you apply the truth to your life, it's like you follow the instructions and you don't get stuff like this. And the, you can imagine if you bake bread like this day after day for years and years, like, why won't it get better? It's just this hard loaf. I don't even like eating it. And you learn there's this truth about how you actually bake bread with yeast and liquid and warmth, and it starts to get better, right? So when we learn what's true, it helps us. So the woman in the story, she got connected with the Lord who was the source of all that's true, and so her life got better. Does that make any sense to you? Maybe. Well, let me just put it this way. If you hear what the Lord tells you in his word and you follow it, you will have great success. Okay? Any questions? All right, let's go sing our next song. Thanks for listening. rise for our next song which is on page 92 in the highways
Freely we have received, freely we give. I invite you to bow your heads for a blessing on the children. May the Lord give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. Amen. I invite the children and teens to go to their programs while we sing our next song. Our next song is Return the Love on page 145. Next reading will be shared by Chuck Ebert. From the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. Then messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, Don't be afraid, just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, 
Why all the commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She is only asleep. The crowd laughed at him. But he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talithi kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then he told them to give her something to eat. Thank you. Two more readings to share with you. First is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 8. My grief is beyond healing. My heart is broken. Listen to the weeping of my people. It can be heard all across the land. Has the Lord abandoned Jerusalem, the people ask? Is her king no longer there? Or why have they provoked my anger with their carved idols and their worthless foreign gods, says the Lord? The harvest is finished and the summer is gone. The people cry, yet we are not saved. I hurt with the hurt of my people. I mourn and am overcome with grief. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why is there no healing for the wounds of my people? And then from the Heavenly Doctrines for the New Church from Secrets of Heaven, 8,364, it says, Sickness, in the internal sense of the word, means the kinds of things that attack our spiritual life. The sicknesses which attack our spiritual life are evils, and they are called evil desires and cravings. The components of spiritual life are faith and charity. Our spiritual life is sick when falsities exist instead of the truth of faith, and evil instead of the good of charity, because they lead to the death of that life, which is called spiritual death and is damnation, just as sicknesses lead to the death of the natural life. Amen. Here in our lessons, and blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. Thou faith, my rock, thou source to lean upon, thou faith, my rock, make this weak one strong. You came as the sun, touching here. Make this week 
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So I think we all can struggle sometimes to get a handle on how there is an all-loving, compassionate and merciful, wise God in a world that is wrought with poverty and war and inequality of means and situation. And there's hardship and physical and mental disabilities and sicknesses of all kinds. We look out there and we struggle with doubt about how that could be so. Or if we in turn get sick ourselves, we wonder how is it possible we can struggle with the idea of where is the Lord in all this. There's a real desperation we can feel when we get sick. And same with looking around the world around us with our eyes wide open and seeing all the hardship and going where is the Lord in all this. And through these lenses that we see the world in, we hear these stories of the Lord Jesus Christ healing people and raising people from the dead or feeding the hungry and all the various miracles that he does. And it's unbelievable in some sense and also undeniable in another. We're drawn to it. We want all of this to be true. And we want it to be possible not just way back when, when these stories were written or when it was, they occurred, but today for us. So one of the exciting things about learning about the Lord is learning the miracles and the healing power that the Lord has. And they have great value because they show us that who Jesus is, that Jesus is God who came on earth, took on a human form to be with us, to show us his true nature and showing us that we can be healed by the Lord. So the questions are, heal us of what exactly and how exactly can we be healed? So imagine a person, and maybe it's you, that's constantly on the move, always working, always running around, can't afford to get sick, too much going on in your life, you're too important, too many responsibilities, and you start to feel badly. And you're fighting against it with all that you have until you figure you can't fight it anymore, and you get sick. And it all comes to a crashing halt. And there's something actually wonderful about that in some ways, being sick, because we are forced to stop. We're forced to live differently. We are forced often to accept help from other people, and we often don't want to receive help or want to be strong, as it were. 
So we have to admit that we're weak and admit that we're vulnerable. And it almost has to happen, I think, in our lives so that we can let go and surrender, uh, some kind of surrender to the fact that we are not perfect, that we don't have power, that the power is from the Lord. Now, of course, the Lord doesn't strike us down with illness to send us a message, say, oh, Dave, you've been misbehaving, I'm going to give you this sickness, right? Smack. That's not how it works. Sometimes the Lord will permit those things to occur, and the wording that the Lord says around this is, as someone who cannot prevent it because of the desired outcome. So the Lord might permit us to experience illness or to be sick because of the desired outcome, which is a change of character or our salvation. This passage from Secrets of Heaven 8227 reads, the belief exists that bad things are attributable to the divine because they are allowed and not taken away. And I know that's a source of a lot of uh, doubt about the existence of God when people say, look around you, you see the world. If there was a God and there was a loving God, God would prevent that from happening and stop it. So there's this belief that that is what happens. And one who allows something and does not take it away when having the power to do so appears to will it and so to be the cause of it. So because the Lord's not stopping it, the Lord must be the one that's causing it to happen. But the passage goes on, but the divine allows it because it cannot be prevented or taken away. The divine wills only what is good. If therefore the divine were to prevent or remove bad things, that is to say the miseries of punishment, fastation, persecution, temptation, and the like, it would be willing something bad. For then the people who must suffer them could not have their faults corrected, and evil would increase until it held sway over good. So in other words, sickness, illness, and temptation are permitted so we can get our faults corrected, as the passage says. So of course, all these sicknesses in the word that are spoken of are really about spiritual sicknesses, spiritual faults that we might have within us that need to be corrected, that need to be healed. So it's not about faith healing or the healing of physical ailments because we have confidence in the divine. Though I'm not going to say it's impossible that working on our spirit will not improve the health of our body. I'm sure that that's quite true in many cases. But, and I'm also going to be careful not to say that if you sin or if you commit evil that you will come down with some disease or get sick physically. Without question, we do not point to an ill person and go, I wonder what sin they committed that they're now sick, right? That's not how that works. And that's pictured in the scripture of the Lord. We talked about that briefly last week with a blind man who was blind from birth. And it says, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth and his disciples asked him saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Because that was the common belief. Someone must have done something wrong. But Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So the healing that occurred helped people to see something about themselves or see something about the power of God. So similarly, these stories are here for us so that the works of God can be seen through them. And sometimes we see the works of God, so to speak, through the attitudes of those around us who are sick in their faith, in their trust, in their perspective. I remember a friend who had breast cancer, and she died from it. But at one point before she died, she came to our home to bring something. I forget what it was. And we were talking about her sickness, and she said, you know, this is a gift. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? How is that possible? It, like, blew my mind to think of it that way. And she said, well, it's been a gift for me because it helps me to see what truly matters in my life, and I can prioritize the things that truly matter. So for her, she saw it as a gift. And I think sometimes that's what we're experiencing, is something that makes us, our sickness or our hardship that we're going through helps us to realize something within ourselves that we need to do differently. Sometimes it's a wake-up call. But our particular story today is about a woman with this flow of blood for 12 years. You can imagine that for 12 years dealing with this thing that has been draining her energy, draining her life from her. I think about it in relation to ourselves. We turn the story towards ourselves and think, have I ever been sapped of energy and that spark for life for a long time? because we've held on to something that we just can't let go of. Maybe we're unable to forgive somebody that has hurt us or wronged us in some way. We're holding on to some sort of hatred or desire for vengeance in our hearts. 
or resentment that someone else got something that you wanted. Maybe it's a promotion or wealth or recognition or talents that you wish you had that they have instead. And these are examples of what this story is picturing. So this woman in the story we're told symbolizes, as the writings say, the church, or in this case, the Lord's kingdom in us. So we think about it, what is that part of me, my spiritual part of my life, dealing with? In bleeding, particulars of, pictures a particular kind of sin in this case, which is hatred or cruelty. And the passage from the writing says that in the opposite sense, blood, because blood can symbolize good things as well. In the opposite sense, it symbolizes violence inflicted upon charity. Consequently, what is contrary to charity and therefore all hatred, revenge, and cruelty. So you can kind of see the symbolism where if we have this resentment or hatred inside of ourselves and it's there and it's sapping our energy, like this, imagine this woman with this, this flow of blood for this amount of time. So the spiritual life draining out of us. I think Nelson Mandela says it quite well when he wrote that resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. The same kind of an idea that we're taking on this, this hatred inside of ourselves, we're letting it fester when it's really not hurting the person that we're holding it towards, it's actually hurting us. It's consuming our charitable impulses, it's consuming our peace of mind and our other desires that are positive. But in the story it says she suffered for many years and spent lots of money, she saw lots of different doctors, lots of different ways to try to change that behavior in herself or that deal, that experience in her. But finally this new opportunity presented itself, this new solution presented itself. And we see often in the Lord's word that there are healings that occur just by either a word that the Lord speaks or a touch, or in this case, touching of his garment. And that pictures that Jesus is God who came on earth in human form, God himself, the word made flesh. And that's why his garments healed because they represented the truth from the Lord's word, not just any old clothes, the Lord has to be within them, or not any old truths, but the Lord has to be present within those. And we have that word available to us at any time. And that's what's different. Do we go to all these different solutions that might be out there to help us with our problems, or do we actually ask the Lord, well, what's your solution to my issue? Do we touch the garment? Do we go to the word and find healing there? The reason it's different is because it's a solution from God directly. And when she touches him, he says, she's healed, and she says, or he says to her, your faith has made you well. Your belief that this can happen does it. Healing happens because when we know what's true, it leads to doing, and doing changes our life, changing our heart. Think about it in terms of baking bread. If I know that I need to add yeast, and I need to let it rise, and I need to knead it, and all those different things, and I don't do it, I'm going to have the same effect over and over again. The bread's going to be bad. But once you know what's true and you apply it to the situation, you can start having success in that. Same thing with our lives. If we know what's true and we actually live by it, it will change who we are. Well, the Old, New Test Old Testament and the book of Revelation speak of two other types of healing medicines. And these two remedies are spoken of in the word to help ease suffering both for ourselves and maybe the people in our lives. And there are types of truths for different types of situations. And the first one is called the Balm of Gilead. We read about it in that Lament of Jeremiah. It says, the harvest is finished, the summer is gone, yet we are not saved. So we're like, why am I not changed yet? What's going on? This sort of frustration. Is there no balm in Gilead? What, is there no physician there? Is there no healing for the wounds of my people? So think of it this way, Jeremiah's question is, how can people who are trading in balm be so sick? In other words, how can people of God who say they believe in God, who have the word in their midst, be so messed up? <laughs> That's sort of what it's saying. You might look at yourself and go, look, I know all this stuff. Why am I so messed up? That's what this is saying. Well, Balm of Gilead pictures the truth of the word. And Jeremiah is saying, you have the word in your hands. You can be healed by it. Why don't you use it? How many of us recognize that in ourselves? Well, I have the medicine. I have medicine cabinet. Why don't I open the medicine cabinet and go to it and find the healing that is there? Because think about it today. 
you may this has already happened for you, maybe it will happen later, you've encountered some resentment perhaps, or some driving is a great place to encounter anger and resentment, right? Or fear, or worry, frustration, grief. So we might just encounter those things during our day. The question is, did we open up the medicine cabinet? Did we take the medicine that we need? Do we go to the Lord? Do we go to the Word? And do we learn what's there and try to live by it? In the Balm of Gilead specifically pictures truths from the Lord's Word to those who actually believe that the Lord's Word makes a difference, that it's true. They go to it because they believe in it. So they go to it and they read it. Think about it in case of forgiveness. There's an idea that for, to be forgiven from something that we've done, we kind of have to accumulate a bunch of opposite things that are good in order to erase the bad thing, right? That notion that if I've done something wrong, I need to make a certain type of amends by doing what's good, and that will balance it out and kind of get rid of it. And maybe we suffer a burden of guilt for many years because we haven't quite resolved that. I don't know about you, but oftentimes the heaping of guilt upon ourselves is much worse than the Lord would ever put upon us, right? We put those coals, hot coals upon ourselves. But the truth of the matter is that the Lord immediately forgives us of everything we've ever done. That's what the Lord teaches. And the Lord is unable to look upon us with a frown or to turn his face away from us. The Lord's unable to do that. The Lord immediately forgives us, and we know that. If we know what forgiveness really is, which is really stopping the behavior, when we stop doing what's wrong, that's when forgiveness really takes place. But as far as the Lord's perspective is, I forgive you immediately. I love you. Let's try to do it differently next time. So there is a balm that's available to us. But if you think about it, if people don't believe the word or they don't go to the word, then those teachings have little effect, right? They have little comfort if you're not going to go to the Lord's Word as a source. So if you don't go to the Lord's Word for a source, the Lord says, well, there's another place where the truth can speak to you. Another type of truth in Revelation, which is symbolized the, in the tree of life that has these leaves that are on the tree, and it says those leaves are for the healing of the nations. And they picture rational truths that people who may not care about the Word or go to the Word or think that it's true, that can help them to see something higher and be impacted by it. And one example of that is people who believe that there's something greater than themselves. Like any 12-step group, for example, the important thing is the belief in a higher power of some sort. We have to believe in something greater than ourselves. There's an author named Bo Lozoff who um, fairly well connect with Mr. Rogers, who you probably know, but um, he wrote this, which I think is a good example of the kinds of things that this is talking about. He says, if people believe that there's something beautiful, something noble, and something sacred, they could never do the horrible things that they do. Something beautiful, like the sunset, if you allow it to touch you, do you and I take time for it in our daily lives? I'm talking about seconds to consciously be moved or touched by something that we consider beautiful. Something beautiful is something that touches us, something that you say, oh my, look at that. Or something noble. But I, by that I mean like that second principle of all great spiritual traditions, something we believe in that's larger than us, something we look up to, a cause or an idea or a person or an elder or a bird or nature, but something that we consider is worth sacrificing for or worth taking a risk for. And then finally, something sacred. Do we have those moments when our heads are truly bowed in humility at the grandeur, the greatness and the vastness, the incomprehensibility of what this human life is every day. Now you might read, hear that and you say, well, that's not overtly religious, but it is something that can help people to connect with something higher. And that's what these rational truths are. And it's healing. So I think the important thing to recognize is that the Lord always provides a way for anyone to be touched by the Lord, to realize that there's something greater than themselves and to have an impact in their lives and find healing. So you guys are here, you have access to the word. You Maybe you don't believe it, maybe you do. But if you do, then you can go to it and find that as a source of comfort. If you don't, then there's other things you can go to too that can help you to see it. The Lord says that all of nature or natural creation is a theater that represents the Lord's kingdom. You might wonder why when I'm walking out in the mountains that I'm so touched by the beauty of it or there's such power there because the Lord 
is there illustrated by everything that's around you. So healing is available in all kinds of ways if we seek it out one way or another. Directly go to the Lord, touch those garments, touch those truths, or just be open to something that's noble, that's beautiful, that's sacred, and that can move us to a higher ground and open our hearts and let that healing occur. Amen. Can you bow your heads with me for a moment? Lord, we thank you for this time where we can perhaps lay down our worries, anxieties, and troubles and hear you speak in your word comfort and hope in the pages that you give us because it's really describing you and who you are and your unending love for us. Thank you for these teachings and for the hope that they provide. Amen. Now we have a moment where if you would like to mention someone or yourself, something that you would like to have a prayer for, we'll have a minute of silent prayer following that. But is there anything that you're thinking about or anyone you're thinking about today? Prayers of gratitude for Jesse and Zane that they made it and that continued prayers for their safety. Thank you, Gary. Yes. Okay. Prayers for your mom. Thank you. Anyone else? Prayers for those in the Bahamas. Thank you, Chuck. Greg? Prayers for all the people who are sick and don't know why. Prayers for all those who are sick and don't know why. Thank you. Yeah. Mary? Um, prayers for Jeff and Mary and Rick who have been sick with me for the last seven months. And, uh, prayers for you and Jeff as the next transition of life. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? All right, let's have a minute of silent prayer. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Let you stand for the closing of the word. Please remain standing for our final song on page 134, Only in God.
Thank you all for being here today, and if you have any comments or questions or thoughts you'd like to share, we have a few minutes for that. If you could speak in the mic, that would be great, so people can hear you. Anybody? Silence the crowd, I like that. All right, then I will not belabor the point on that one. All right. Um, couple announcements. First of all, this coming Sunday is our 25-year anniversary as a church congregation, and uh, we're celebrating that here. And there's a couple things in here about what you can do to help with that. There's an invitation to bring some finger food, appetizer, dip, that kind of stuff. We will provide uh, drinks and ice cream to enjoy afterwards. And um, during the service, if you have a favorite passage or quote, or uh, something that you've learned, some way that the teachings of the church have impacted you, there'll be time to share those. And then afterwards, during our celebration time, there'll be um, an open mic if you have any stories you want to share, memories or whatever, or short speeches, <laughs> whatever you want to say, um, thoughts to share. Should be a fun day, and uh, I'm hoping to have a slideshow. Cool. Thank you, Fred. And uh, Pete Buss and Teresa will be here. The new executive bishop are in town, and they'll be here to celebrate with us. So um, I think that's all I'll say about that. There's a new discussion group on, what day is that? Tuesday. We're studying divine love and wisdom, if you want to join us for that. And um, I guess the rest of it's in the bulletin, so you can read it. So, Dwight. I have one comment about your sermon. Yeah. Yep. That purifies the soul, and it's kind of a sad idea, but I know Scott Jetson did a good one for it. And that's the beauty of it, where he, he almost speaks out his loneliness as, as, a, um, as a message. 
Mm. Yeah. Well, there, I mean, that passage is implied that the reason we're allowed, to, the Lord permits sicknesses so that that kind of thing can occur, that growth can occur. Um, so I think it sort of aligns with that. I don't know that I would seek illness in order to grow spiritually, but um, that's a bit more, more advanced than I'm inv- uh, willing to, to go to. But um, I think it arrives plenty on its own without my support, without encouraging it. So, well, interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, I'm sure you've experienced it. I mean, sometimes when we're sick, we make these idle promises to the Lord that we'll never do anything wrong ever again, that kind of stuff, right? And I don't think that's the kind of stuff we're talking about when we recognize faults in ourselves and we realize that there are changes that can be made and we we do that. So, yeah, there's definitely growth opportunities available to us. Um, But again, the Lord's not striking it, not putting it upon you. Sicknesses or illnesses have a different origin, not the Lord. Anything else?